afternoon, everybody. So um, as James correctly said, this is gonna, gonna be a quick synopsis of a part-time PhD that I'm currently undertaking at the University of Winchester. I'm currently two years into a seven-year process, and I'm just at the, in, at the stage where I'm collecting data. So I'm just gonna bring you up to speed with what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and where I am with regards to initial results. So it's gonna be quite quick, because I've had to cram loads of information in. So do ask me if you've got any questions at the end. I should say the PhD has come out as a result of the Our Past, Our Future project and it was, uh, it was identified by Denise Hew Hewlett and um, John Pemberton that the New Forest Knowledge would, in particular would offer an opportunity to look at how we can use citizen science, the general public and local communities to engage with their heritage and I was fortunate enough to be awarded the PhD and this is what the route I've taken with it. So quick overview. Um, I'm particularly interested in protected landscapes and how people engage with them. So I'll be doing a quick overview of protected landscapes, the problems that they face, the new forest as a case study, how we manage our heritage, how we engage the public, my research, um, the use of mobile devices, anonymised mobile phone data, social media and looking forward. And that's if I don't get a red card before that. So what are protected landscapes? Protected landscapes are clearly defined geographical spaces recognised, dedicated and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve long-term conservation of nature with associated, associated ecosystem services and cult, um, cultural values. And here's some of the views you might consider to be a protected landscape um, as seen on National Parks UK website. We have 56 designated um, protected landscapes in, in England. 10 of which are national parks, uh, 46 are areas of outstanding natural beauty and their remit are to conserve and enhance their natural, natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage um, and to promote public understanding, enjoyment and um, of these um, special qualities and that's an important part for us to consider as I go forward in this talk. But national parks and protected landscapes have a series of pressures. Uh, you might have seen recently there was a series of articles about how, how funding towards national parks have been slashed. And um, there's a certain degree of insecurity, un, 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 unknown with regards to Brexit around the corner, potential opportunities, not necessarily um, um, threats, but we don't know what Brexit means at the moment. It just means Brexit. Um, and only this week, Whilst we have slashed, um, well, we have insecurities, we have um, in uh, unclear futures, um, we also have things moving forward as normal. And just this week, Historic England um, launched their Heritage at Risk register, uh, a number of which um, see sites in the New Forest added to the Heritage at Risk um, register. And these are nationally important um, sites that are under threat and we, we as a national park, the Forestry Commission as landowners, um, have to look to ensure these monuments survive and are protected into the future. So a lot of you all know about the Big Society, it was David Cameron's great idea in 2014. Um, we were coming out of a recession, we want to engage um, local people in their communities, in their heritage, in getting involved and making a bigger picture. And Volunteering as a whole in the UK is a massive thing. In between 2014 and 15, we saw 14.2 million people volunteer once a month. Um, but it's quite easy to be cynical about it, and we can say that actually the big society is actually just getting people to do jobs that you, people used to get paid for, and it's changing the public sector into the big society. But the main aspects of the big society that I'm interested in are giving people uh, giving communities more power, encouraging people to take an active role in their community and publishing government's big data. Um, and as I say, it's easy to be critical of engaging communities and uh, local people in um, protected landscapes and their heritage, but it's, it is identified quite, di quite diversely, and I won't read all of these out, that, that the importance of gauging, um, engaging local communities and individuals with their heritage, with protected landscapes for a whole variety of reasons. And HLF, who will be speaking next, also identify that it's a great, it's very important to engage local communities, hence why we have our past, our future. 
So the New Forest, we, get, we have 5 million people living within 90 minutes of the New Forest and 90% of the visitors that come and use the forest and utilise it um, spend part of their time walking and cycling and this is an important part but the majority of people that visit are over the age of 35. A bit of background, just to, it, it will provide context as we go on. Um, the heritage we have in the New Forest is diverse and fascinating as we found out over the last couple of days. Um, we as a national park have an obligation to protect this heritage whether it's through planning or protection and there's two, two acts that have really seen the, a unique situation in the New Forest where we have somewhat of a time capsule. So the creation of the forest in 1079 or perhaps earlier as we heard yesterday um, and the creation of the New Forest National Park Authority in 2006 has meant that the, the her cultural heritage, the archaeology in the New Forest is in somewhat of a time capsule protected from tra traditional pressures such as intensive farming or um, development of houses, and buildings and industry. And as a result we have some fantastic extant archaeological features that can be found across the whole of the New Forest. And as mentioned there are financial restraints and restrictions and, um, and cuts that have taken place, place over the last few years. And as a result, organisations such as the New Forest National Park Authority rely on external funding to help support and ex extend our research and protection of cultural heritage. And at present, we have two externally funded schemes that um, provide this support, the first of which is Our Past, Our Future, um, and the second of which is the Landscape um, is the verders of the New Forest High Level Stewardship Scheme, both of which run out in 2020, both of which provide a heritage aspect of the projects. It's not purely heritage, but both look to engage local volunteers, local interest groups into recording and managing archaeological sites across the New Forest. And they're not unique. Over the last 10 years, we've also had a rapid coastal zone assessment and the New Forest Remembers World War II project, both of which were funded through the Heritage Lottery Fund. And all of these projects have shown the power of the people. Uh, in last year alone, we had 638 volunteer days undertaken as part of the New, For New Forest National Park Authority's um, projects. Now, that excludes the Forestry Commission volunteer rangers in the New Forest and a series of other great organisations that um, provide volunteering opportunities that feed into the management and protection of the New Forest's unique environment. Um, over the last 10 years, we've identified thousands of archaeological sites. These are the, the latest HER records. Um, tens of monuments have been restored, identified through the work and restored and, and improved. Um, hundreds of oral histories have been recorded to ensure their longevity into the future. Um, we've had crowdsourced translations of German prisoner of war camps um, newsletters that were done across the globe. Um, but the average age of our participants in these is, is over 50, which is, is understandable. It's, it's, it's getting to that point where people are retiring, they have a bit more time on their hands. Um, and that, that work that they do is, saves a considerable amount of money and time that would otherwise have to be done pro by professionals or not be done at all. Um, and I think it's safe to say we, we've engaged local people with their heritage and it's been a fantastically positive last 10 years. However, now there's a load of writing on here, I'm not going to read it all out, but what it effectively sums up is that, that there's an audience that's being completely missed within our work, and that's the audience of younger people, 12 to 24 year olds. Um, the research that was done as part of the Our Past, Our Future um, project preparation identified um, that young people struggle to engage with and assess many things that make our heritage unique. Um, the audience development showed that young people feel um, unable to access and participate in heritage in the heritage of the park due to multiple barriers including transport, organisational attitudes, um, confidence, understanding and relevance of the parks at the park in their lives. Um, where, where heritage engagement is taking place with younger people, it generally relies on project officers and the enthusiasm of those project officers. And there isn't really a sustainable, holistic approach 
to um, engaging these younger people and audiences with their with their heritage. So once the projects finish, they continue to do this work and engage. And also, heritage organisations that were surveyed show lack of knowledge of where and how to reach younger people, um, and a lack of experience, confidence, and resources around youth engagement. So. What do we need to know before we can engage with this audience? Um, we, we'd like to know uh, what they're doing, how they're learning about the New Forest and its heritage, where, where they're going, what they're interested in, um, and how we can get this, this information honestly, quickly, and easily, because trying to put a uh, survey mon monkey questionnaire out to a bunch of teenagers to, if you send it to 100, the likelihood of getting one back is pretty impressive. So how do you get that information it, without drawing blood from a stone? Um, and then when you have all this information, um, how can we use it to engage a, a, a younger age group with protected landscapes, cultural heritage, and perhaps citizen science? So my research has two main aims associated with it. First of all, I want to evaluate the potential of big data and mobile technology to enhance cultural heritage management in protected landscapes. Um, and then once I've done that, I want to impl implement a project which makes best use of this data um, and mobile technology as a means to encourage 12 to 24 year olds um, with heritage in protected landscapes. And of those sub aims, the main things that I'm going to be talking about today are anonymized mobile data, the use of anonymized mobile data, mobile technology, and social medias. So we as a UK are now a smartphone society. I think the world is a smart, smartphone society. Seven out of ten of us will have a smartphone device. Um, that more people in the world have a smartphone than have flushing toilets. Um, so they're, they're pretty they're pretty they part and parcel of our daily life. And the, the increased computing power, the size and the functionality of these devices has meant that jobs that were previously only possible on a computer are now possible in our hand um, instantly. And the top most common things that are used to um, you, we, we use our mobiles for are for internet um, use, social media, an important one there, a series of other bits and bobs, and the last one there, cameras and taking photographs. Um, and this increased computing power, this increased availability is, is deemed to be, um, is, or is recognised um, for the growth and interest around citizen science fueled work within, um, within research. So how can we use these increasingly powerful um, special devices that most people have access to um, to record and manage our cultural heritage. They, they provide a fantastic opportunity to develop um, programs and ap applications, websites for people to engage with. Um, functionality is huge, GPS opportunities, photographs, sound recordings, mapping. Um, and we use these devices today with our volunteers to record the archaeology on the open forest. Um, but it's important when building these things, a number of projects that are undertaken to engage local groups produce a um, output, a final product. But there's no engagement with the people beforehand. So it's important to build what is wanted or what is needed to produce this work and what will be used as opposed to what we think people are going to use. So. Mobile phones are everywhere, and the likelihood is that most of us drove here today with our phones on us. We, we sat here with our phones turned on. And m most of us these days have contract mobile phones. Contract mobile phones provide a fantastic, if not a little bit scary, opportunity for us to see what people are doing. And that's anonymized mobile data. So the com effectively how it works is if you were to park up near Brockenhurst, imagine each of these black dots are telephone masts. As you go for a nice walk around Whitemore, you'll enter into different cell, uh, cell tower cells. And each time you enter that cell, your phone will send a small blip to the cell tower and say, it will tell you, it will go, oh, okay, 
you're closest to me. So if someone's going to phone you, I'll connect to your phone. But it also provides a GPS point to your mobile phone company. And that information, as you walk around, gets stored, sent back to your mobile phone company, and that's, that's one journey. And it will identify points where you stayed still, points where you started, and points where you stopped, or you finished. And that information can be sold to advertising companies and researchers and anyone else that feels it is of use for their, for their work. You can also gain information from this, inf from this data. So although it's anonymized, your, your name is taken away from it, your company will provide them with your age, your gender, and some of them have these amazing algorithms that calculate income, occupation, and other aspects. But I'm not so interested in those. I'm more interested in geography, age, and perhaps gender, but maybe not so much. So other than the scarier side, which suggests where you can, how you should advertise something, um, what we can do is look at this data to see how people are using protected landscapes and how specific demographics are moving within protected landscapes. So this is a normalised mobile data of the South Downs National Park. Um, it's, um, it was work that was done by Lucha, which is Telefonica or O2. And this is a single day's number of visitors to the South Downs National Park. So they had over 1,300,000 visitors. Of that, um, just over 100,000 were residents, 21,000 were workers, and 1,200,000 were uh, visitors. And we can start to see the demographic of those people. So most people going to uh, the South Downs National Park are over the age of 29, but that's probably because most people over the age of uh, or 19, sorry, um, or 25, um, have cars. So that's perhaps irrelevant, but interesting to a degree. Here's some similar work by City Logic, um, who used Vodafone's data, and they were looking at who was visiting a heritage canal site in uh, northern Wales. And here, this heat map shows where visitors were coming from. So it turns out people from Dorset are quite crazy about. Welsh canals. Um, but it gives you an idea of who's going and then you, st and you start at attaching um, a bit more background information as to age and gender that, and age groups. You can start to see how these demographics are visiting these sites and how they're using. Up here on the South Downs, Lewis is clearly a very central point of the South Downs National Park and it sticks out like a sore thumb. There are a number of considerations, not least, as I mentioned, the big brother aware aspect of it. How many people are aware that their data is available for, people, for the highest bidder um, to be used as, as and when they want? Um, there's, so there's a certain ethical aspect to consider around that. Um, and also Apple recently developed, painted a, a um, patented a tracking system for real-time movement of people. On your phone, if you've seen when there's busy traffic, on your maps and you know to avoid that, that's because they're tracking everyone in their cars. It's live data. It's powerful, it's exciting, it's useful. It's a little bit scary, but look at that side. It can be really interesting. Um, other considerations is mobile phone coverage and the network coverage in the New Forest. Cell tower coverage across the National Park is relatively poor and that will be linked to um, impact of visualisation and our landscape officers' views on whether towers should go up or not, that that coverage is relatively poor and as a result will affect the quality of the um, anonymised mobile phone data, whilst also affects the quality of perhaps a mobile phone driven application that requires mobile data. The next aspect of data that I'm looking to draw from and learn about is social media. Um, it's, it's no secret that teens and younger audiences engage with social media. And the top ones of those at the moment is Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. And the ones I'm particularly interested in are Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. And it, it's, I hope that these, these sites and sources will provide us a bit of insight into these this age group's interests, thoughts, activities, and trips. Um, problem is, it's a huge amount of data. Um, and 
the only way really to gather that information at the moment is to use resources such as Keyhole, which you pay hundreds of pounds for. They'll collect all that data for you and spew it out, but you don't really know how and what they've done, how they've done that and what, what they've done to get that information. So as part of my research, I'm collating this data myself to, uh, to inform my research. Uh, first of which is Instagram. This is a photographic um, recording so, um, social media. has 800, 800 million users and people use hashtags to show where they are and what they're associating their picture with. Um, I tried to gather a day's worth of images with hashtag new forest attached to them and this took five days to collate 240 photos so it wasn't very realistic. So much like Iris's work, I looked to automate this process. I use something called uh, Scrapper, which pulls the information off the internet for me using a Python script. TensorFlow, which is a Google deep learning um, plugin, much like uh, similar, similar to what Iris has looked at. And I sh shoved it all into a database. So over a month, I gathered 12,000 hashtag New Forest photographs from Instagram. Um, within these, there were 24, nearly 25,000 different hashtags associated with the New Forest. Um, the most popular of those you can see on the screen. Um, there were only five posts with hashtag heritage uh, and uh, two with hashtag archaeology, which gives us an insight into how people see that as interest. That's not perhaps new because it's linked to copies work that Keith Chalice has done in the past with Twitter. Um, to 725 different locations. Um, with, and just over half the images didn't have locations attached to them. So we have geolocations attached to the, the pictures. And the deep learning provided um, thousands of images um, interpretations. So over 1,000 images of horses were identified, 740 images um, of cattle and megaliths, which end up being trees. So there's a bit of tweaking <laughs> to be there. So here are some of the... Um, the images associated with archaeology and heritage, I won't go into them too much. There's two of them come from an archaeologist from the New Forest National Park, so it's kind of <laughs> not that useful. But um, even interpretations of a shop selling witch memorabilia is seen as heritage, which is quite interesting. Locations, there are four different new forests. There's the New Forest, the New Forest, New Forest National Park in hyphens, and New Forest National Park without hyphen, hyphens. Um, but within the locations that were picked up associated with the, these hashtags, we do get heritage sites such, such as the RAF Airfields, St. Barb's, uh, Buckland Rings, Leek, Cowshot, Bewley Abbey, Hearst Castle, Buckler's Hard and Stonehenge. Obviously, that was removed. So this map just shows the density of where people are visiting, what, so across the New Forest. The number, it's a heat, simple heat map that shows where people are and how often people are sharing photographs of them. So we start to get an idea of how people are moving around the New Forest, and obviously Lindhurst and Brockenhurst stick out quite clearly. We can also look at associated ha hashtags with the location. So Burley, people think about landscape and landscape photography and travel, whereas in New Forest National Park, people think of trees, the summer, and other aspects. So we can delve into those links. And the deep learning provided thousands of different Im um, interpretations of the Im images, giving us a, an average score or a, a likelihood of what that image actually shows. So it's worked really well with bicycles. Um, you can see it gives us an idea of when people are going off into the forest and doing bits of pops. Churches, it ident identifies 200, 124 churches, only half of which are actually churches, but it does also identify <laughs> war memorials. So although it's, it, there's some tweaking to be done, it, it is pulling out heritage features. And it's very good at lighthouses. So this is Hearst <laughs> Spit, where we've got a fantastic amount of lovely photos of Hearst Spit. So there are a number of things as to consider with regards to social media um, etiquette, where people um, behave in particular ways they feel they should do on social media. And this is prevalent within teenage behavior. Teenagers often have private accounts, so I'm not seeing all the images that perhaps the, this age group I'm interested in are showing. Um, not all the images are in the new, fo new forest or geolocated. There are adverts thrown in there. There are images associated, issues associated with the deep learning, ethical questions, but it's quick, it's cost effective, and it is insightful into this demographic. My next step will be to move on to Twitter, which will give, us, give me 32, 328 million users, 
Um, we can, again, we can see how pe what people are doing. This is once someone climbing Penny Fan in um, Brecon Beacon National Parks. This is someone flying their drone in the New Forest National Park. And this is someone going for a walk in the New Forest National Park. We can start to see, again, activity and movement and, geo and how people are using and um, participating with the New Forest and if they're associating that stuff with heritage. And my final thing to look at will be Snapchat, which they've recently provided an opportunity to heat maps to show where people are within the New Forest, what they're doing. In this case, someone's at Denny Lodge. They've <laughs> highlighted it's the New Forest National Park, and they seem to be doing some recreational drug activity. <laughs> so what next? So there's a bit of whistle-stop tour, but um, the next step is to collect all my data and understand and analyse it. There's going to be a lot there. I've got to get the mobile phone data and see where people are moving. I've got to get the social media data and look at the patterns. And then I want to talk to the audience themselves and see how that correlates. As I mentioned, that could be like getting blood out of a stone, and it may not be an accurate representation of what they're doing and thinking. So it'll be interesting to compare that. And then once I've used that, once I've got that information, I'd like to create a project and implement it to see if we can engage those younger audiences. Thank you for listening.